We need to understand that, that actually in the space of contributing information about the city, there is role both for the affluent citizens and for marginalized groups, and they will have different views and different aspects. And a point that I will raise is that citizen science can be seen as a way for societal return on the huge investment that we put now into higher education and kind of allowing people to study for a long time and through the participation of highly educated people in monitoring birds or monitoring wildlife or just looking at different things in the city we can actually get a benefit that benefit everyone in terms of better managing the environment yet in order to engage marginalized and disadvantaged groups there is a need to pay special attention either to think about ways that engage them or get the people that I've just mentioned, those that are, have the free time and resources to work together with marginalized groups. That's one potential of development. The other direction of development is to do special programs. In some project, we kind of paid community members to be citizen scientists and joint researchers in order to coordinate the activity and carry it out. In other cases, it was done more on a volunteering basis, but it needs to be adjusted to the community and the context. It's actually doing it already, but we have to remember that that's how science mainstream science is. It's already been directed and it's all done in a way that answers the questions and the issues of the highly educated and affluent group of people who are the academics. And that's the shape of science for a very long time. So in a way, citizen science, even on its most biased way when we are recruiting people who are all have PhDs but not working in academia, is already opening the scientific practice into new voices of people that are outside and having different life experiences. When we are opening it up further, we can have then the different views of society and it creates all kind of tension for the scientists when they need to actually listen to communities and follow what they need. The reliability of the data is beyond question if it, the project has been designed and executed properly. There are over 60 paper, papers that are demonstrating that the quality of the data is very high. Yet, for policymakers and for scientists, they find it hard to accept citizen science data or citizen generated data and are making claim that it's not of good data quality. At least part of the story is status anxiety. They are the experts, they know how to collect data, it's their way of collecting data that should count and not all these pesky people who are going around. It's very difficult for an expert to accept that you release the, the only power that you've got, which is the power over knowledge, to other people and turn into a co-production mode. And that's a challenge because we don't educate experts to do that and we don't always have the mechanism to kind of help them with the facilitation of such activity. The interesting cases are where you want to and that's where really productive and interesting relationship between uh, the government and the expert and the citizens are evolving. But it's difficult, it's culturally really, really difficult and challenging for everyone who is involved in the process. It is a legitimate concern about the, the aspect of expert and so on. 
and there are examples out there, which is that's the stage where you can see the difference between the populist narrative, where they actually not trying to do the science, they're just trying to make the case in whatever mean and kind of rely on science and saying that the science is wrong, um, and, and they're not following it all the way through. And then that group continued to find other reasons but dropped that type of argument and stopped collecting this data. So there can be a dialogue to some extent, and, and it sometimes can cause issues within this populist narrative. Uh, but in general, as long as everyone following the very basic empiricist approach to science, that we collect the data and we we'll listen to the data for what it shows, then it can be a tool to actually get into negotiation within different narratives. The issue of, of uncertainty is always fundamental to the way science works, but scientists were kind of either talking about not sharing it with policymakers, and in some cases, and we've seen it in parts of the pandemic, and for a very long time there was a big fight between different groups of scientists about the fact, is it airborne or not? So the whole issue of masks, and then which type of masks are the right one to stop the virus from spreading? Now, that bit was kind of hidden when you are getting into government decisions. It was all decided to kind of just send you one message about how things are working. None of the instruction of the government was actually thinking about the everyday life of that community, of multiple family living in one household, in a not enough money so they can't just stop and all stay at home, of kids not being able to sit at home and study because there is no space. And if there is space, there is no laptop. And if there is a laptop, there is one for the whole family. And all these kind of aspects were not taken into account into decision making of scientists, which, as we mentioned earlier, are from middle class background and just don't have the experiences of other people around. And you start thinking, maybe in such situation, it would be better if we had a kind of ongoing citizen assembly of representing the different types in society and really democratizing the construction of knowledge in every bit of life. Can we have a better system in which we democratize knowledge production in a real way? Science, for me, for example, I've, I've written once that, that science is the least worth method that we have to constructing human knowledge. But because it's the least worst, it's not the best, it needs to operate together with other forms of knowledge. And in different areas, we're seeing now opening. So opening to alternative forms of knowledge. In the recent uh, COP meeting around the biodiversity, there is acceptance of more local knowledge and requirement that it will be part of the picture and so on. And we need it so much more because what science knows is very limited and what humanity knows is huge and we need to kind of reconcile those two things and not think that one mode of knowledge is superior by definition. So the first thing is that it's already happening that, that in order to create the data sets that we train AI, and if you'll start looking at the different literature on, an, on AI, you will see that some of it is actually quite terrifying in the sense of how small the data sets that scientists are using in order to train the, the artificial intelligence model. Part of why they are relatively small is because the scientists doing the classification and the uh, definition themselves, and they have limited time, so they have doing fairly small case study. Citizen science open up the ability, for example, of sharing millions of images with people, people joining in into the process of classifying it, and then that information is feeding to much better AI model. And what's more, the people who've been involved in the classification can also deal with things that the AI is signaling that there is high uncertainty and kind of help in classifying it and making those models better. Now, in terms of the wider science, transdisciplinarity 
is the term that it's important because that's the one when you engage not just between disciplines and try to create something new, which is what interdisciplinarity is, but in transdisciplinarity you go out to society, you engage communities, you engage policy makers, you engage uh, businesses and so on. And that's a space where there is a lot of opportunity also for citizen science to engage. Too long, too short in terms of answer? Okay. <laughs>